When P&O Cruises first announced their new cruise ship Iona, she was promised to be the start of a new era in travel. She cost £700 million to build and expectations were definitely high. I've just disembarked a week-long cruise and before this I thought I knew P&O Cruises pretty well, but I saw things, I did things, I experienced things on this cruise that I would have never expected from P&O. I was originally meant to cruise on Iona in January of 2021 and I was absolutely gutted when that didn't happen. I knew though that I had to get on board and I had to explore this cruise ship, so I booked a very cheap seven night Northern Europe cruise with my brother. We paid £439 each for a seven night cruise including gratuities, so I didn't go into this cruise with huge expectations. The embarkation process was pretty easy for us. We went through a drive-through Covid testing centre and then we sat in our car waiting for our results. When we had those negative results and we had our car parking all sorted, we were free to go into the terminal and to check in for our cruise. Like most cruises at the moment, you do need quite a lot of paperwork to embark. I had been in Spain the week before and when I told that to the lady at the check-in desk, she did look a bit concerned. I had read P&O's terms and conditions inside out and I knew that I was okay to board this cruise, but when she went off to get her manager and then came back, I was nervous. It was fine. I did go on the cruise. This isn't the end of the video. But for those few seconds, I was very nervous. Normally when you embark a cruise ship, you will wander off, you will do whatever you'd like to do. You might go to your cabin, you might get some food, you might get some drink, but that was slightly different on this cruise. It's a legal requirement that everybody taking a cruise has to take part in a safety drill. Before COVID, that would normally look like going to what is called your muster station and either standing on the promenade deck or sitting in the theater and being told things like how to put on your jacket and where to go in an emergency. Due to social distancing, this is no longer the case and I'm quite glad it's not the case. What normally happens now is that you go to your muster station to check in and then you'll watch the safety videos on your cabin TV. This is what happened on our P&O cruise and after we had that QR code scanned, we began the long, long walk to our cabin. Iona is a very big cruise ship and I did know that when I booked her. I think it's very different though looking at the deck plans on the website before you go on the cruise and actually being there, looking down the corridor and realising how big this cruise ship is. Iona is massive. The last couple of cruise ships I've been on have been half the size of Iona. For those of you who understand gross tonnage, Iona is around 180,000 gross tonnes and she can hold 5,200 passengers with 1,700 crew members. She's a very big cruise ship. One thing that I thought was really cool, and I've never seen it quite like this on a cruise ship before, was that the artwork above the stairs would tell you where you were on the ship. These would be blue if you were at the front of the ship, grey in the middle and red at the back. I have a terrible, terrible sense of direction and being able to look at a colour and know where I am, that was very, very helpful for me. We booked the cheapest cabin on the ship, which was a guaranteed inside cabin. This meant that we just picked the inside cabin part and we didn't specifically pick the cabin location. We were assigned a cabin, cabin 11115, and it was right at the back of the ship, as in there was not a single inside cabin further back than us, right at the back of the ship. I loved having a cabin number like 11115. We had to tell our cabin number to quite a few people on the cruise when we were checking in for the restaurants, when we were checking in for the theatre, but more about that later. It was just nice to have one that was so easy to remember. I'm a firm believer in the fact that you do not need to spend a lot of money on your cabin to enjoy a cruise. I hate the idea that somebody would be put off cruising because they think that they need a balcony cabin or hire to enjoy a cruise. You don't. Inside cabins, they're perfectly fine and I like them. Our cruise cards were in an envelope outside our cabin and quite a few cruise lines do embarkation like this. I do often hear the argument of what if somebody gets there before me, they get my card and they get into my room. That's not really something that I've ever worried about because if they did get there before you took your card, they'd just be stood in an empty room. So I don't know why they would want to do that. And if they're already on a cruise ship, they already have their own cabin. So that's not something that's, that's ever bothered me. And no one's ever been in my room when I've got there, which is good. I really liked our inside cabin. It was very comfortable and we were very happy in there for a week. I will be bringing you a full video about that cabin because I think it does deserve it. So please just check that you're subscribed so that you don't miss that video. After completing our mustard drill, we went and we started to explore the ship. For me, I think this is my favourite feeling and my favourite part about cruising, where you run around the ship and you're trying to take in everything at once. It can be a little bit overwhelming on a ship 
as big as Iona, but I think that's all part of the fun. We went straight to Iona's Sky Dome, and I think the Sky Dome is one of the places that really sets Iona apart from other cruise ships. There is a big swimming pool here, but the space is used for so much more than just swimming. Iona has four swimming pools, this one that's inside, three that are outside, and 16 whirlpools. It also has what felt like thousands and thousands of seats outside. Not used too much on our cruise because it was pretty chilly, but it's nice to know that there is a lot of outside space. Iona is one of the very few cruise ships that's designed for cold weather. Often when we take a cruise here from the UK or in Northern Europe, a lot of the ship doesn't get used because it is cold outside, but it didn't feel like that was a problem on Iona. There was plenty of space inside for everybody. On our sailing, the ship was around 65% capacity and P&O are slowly increasing that. Only time will tell how the ship feels at 100% capacity, but I am going to be finding out more about that later. The Sky Dome area is used as a pool during the day and you'll find a couple of bars there and a place to get food. The poolside grill venue is called Taste 360 and it does your usual poolside food. They'll have pizzas, they'll have burgers, they'll have chips. I even saw things like meatballs in there at one point. They had a veggie burger for me which was absolutely amazing and I hope that the rest of the food will be as good as the food in the poolside grill. If the food in the poolside grill is good, that's normally a good sign for the rest of the ships. Whenever we sat down here, which we did a few times, we would have a waiter with us within five or 10 minutes. I'm sure that was helped by the reduced capacity, but it was very nice to never really have to wait for anything. Speaking to other people on the cruise, one thing that definitely seemed to divide people was the fact that most restaurants had to be booked in advance on your phone. That's totally fine for me. I don't mind, I've always got my phone in my hand, but I do know a lot of people who really don't like to use their phones for things when cruising. And p and cruises, it's kind of assumed that you will be booking everything on your phone. I like to eat quite early and there are only two of us on this cruise so I definitely think that helped us to get the bookings that we wanted. If you were cruising as a big party or maybe you wanted to eat at a more kind of prime time later in the evening it might be a bit more tricky to get bookings. You probably would just have to plan things a bit more in advance. With over 3,000 people on our cruise though I understood why everything had to be booked. It's not so much that this is a P&O cruises thing as this is just a large ship thing on almost all mega ships you'll find that you have to book things in advance because there's 3,000 people that they're trying to get fed every evening. I don't blame them for trying to organise things. We tried our best to try as many restaurants on board. p and have four main dining rooms. Each one has flexible dining and you don't have to book those in advance. Instead of booking in advance, what you can do is you can join something that's called the virtual queue. This is basically replacing the idea that you'd go and you'd stand in line waiting for your table to be ready. You just tell the app how many of you there are, if you need a wheelchair space, and then you kind of request the booking. We would use usually be in the cabin getting ready for dinner and when we were all dressed and ready to go we would just press the join queue button. It never took more than five minutes and when it was ready we would just wander to the dining room. I quite like that, I don't really want to stand in lines when I'm on a cruise. Note that we normally say Q, not line here in the UK. p and are a very British cruise line. Americans can cruise with them, but you'll probably notice quite a few Britishisms throughout this video. I've got to be honest, I did find it a little bit overwhelming when I first got on the cruise, being presented with all of these dining options, not knowing which ones I had to book, which ones I had to join the virtual queues for. I've cruised before, so I have some idea of how cruise ship dining works, but if you're somebody who's never been on a cruise before, or maybe you're used to cruising where you have a fixed table and a fixed time, it could be quite overwhelming. The food was really good and you don't want to miss out on any restaurant. This kind of overwhelming amount of choice is just something that comes with these mega huge cruise ships. And I mean, watching videos like this on the internet is probably the best way to prepare. So good for you, well done. p and Cruises app did work quite well for us for most of the cruise. It isn't truly an app, as in an app that you download to your phone. It's just a web page that you view that has all of the information that you need. You don't have to pay for Wi-Fi to use the Cruise Lines app but you have to connect to it so that the ship can get you information to your phone. It wasn't just the dining options that had to be booked ahead of time, you also had to book the theatre shows. The capacity within the theatre was reduced slightly for social distancing, you had to wear a mask and nobody was allowed any drinks in the theatre. It was a bit strange for me, my last cruise was with Morella where they literally hand you a drink as you go into the theatre, but on P&O, no drinks in the theatre at the minute. I booked 
booked a couple of the main shows on the website before I went on board. If you're traveling as a big party, it may be worth doing that just so that you can all see it at the same time on the same night. For other things, we had no problem booking them on board, but it was really easy to do on the website. If you know you wanna go, just do it in advance. Each of the main shows was shown three times per night and two nights in a row. How the dancers and the singers do the show three times to date, I have no idea, but I'm glad they do. On one night, we wanted to go to the theatre at 8.30, but it was sold out, so we booked the later show. It was around 8 p.m., we were in a lounge, we were feeling in that kind of theatre mood. So I said to my brother, why don't I try and cancel the later one and rebook, hoping maybe someone has, has cancelled. He looked at me kind of saying, well, you can, I think it's pointless, but you can. It works. So if you haven't got a space, just check closer to the time. Maybe somebody else has cancelled and you'll probably be able to go whenever you want to go. When I was on board Iona, there were two main theatre shows called Festivals and Centre Stage. The singers and the dancers were all brilliant. It was songs that I knew, songs that I liked. I'm quite a visual person. I like to see costume changes. I like to see bright colours and the shows had all of that. We did see a comedian in the theatre, we would go to game shows in the lounges, we even watched two presentations about satellites, which was very interesting. I learned a lot of things about satellites, including how to spell the word satellite. I didn't know it had two L's. <laughs> I usually like to go to the theatre every day when I cruise, but because the shows were repeated two days in a row, that's not really how our evenings ended up working. What I did like though was that they also had shows in the dome. They would have these huge acrobatic shows. So we would normally either go to the theatre or go to a dome show after dinner in the evening. The dome had all of these lights on it, there would be lasers, there would be fog, you name it. It was a really cool venue for acrobatics and also for music. We saw the amazing band She on board, we also saw the house band Pulse, all of them great. I heard that there were 30 musicians on board and I can believe it because there was a lot of music around the ship all the time. For the kind of main acrobatic shows, it was pretty tricky to get a seat if you arrived within maybe 20 minutes before the show. If you want a seat for the acrobatic show, I would recommend getting there half an hour early. There's bars there, you can just sit and have a drink, but just save your seat. If you don't mind standing, you don't need to worry about that. The shows weren't usually very long, we usually just stood. Most nights we would watch some sort of live music in a lounge, and because of COVID rules, nobody was allowed to dance on the actual dance floor. Everybody was welcome to dance near their tables on the carpet and people did do that people would be dancing absolutely everywhere we did go to karaoke one night and it was quite amusing because the person singing had to wear a mask at the moment when you're on a piano cruise you have to wear a mask unless you're seated in a bar or a lounge or a restaurant all of us seated watching the karaoke didn't have masks on and we were all singing along but the person who was trying to sing was wearing a mask they did an absolutely amazing job i don't know how they did it they just did but i feel like maybe they could have just put them behind a screen maybe disinfected the microphone i guess it's to do with the spray when you sing. I don't know, it was good fun anyway, it just struck me as a bit odd. When I first booked this cruise, we were supposed to be visiting Hamburg, Rotterdam and Bruges. It was about a week before the cruise that I heard that Hamburg had been replaced with Le Havre. For those of you who don't know, Le Havre is known as the gateway to Paris. It's about a three hour drive to Paris, so I knew I wasn't going to do that. And I was looking forward to visiting Hamburg, but I'll get there another day. In Bruges and Rotterdam, we created our own walking tours. We would go and see the cube houses in Rotterdam. We went and saw all of the quaint little streets in Bruges. It's very easy to walk around Bruges and Rotterdam and the biggest problem that we had was trying to do our walks when it wasn't raining. We did manage it. Most days we did 20,000 steps per day and I even found the world's biggest Pepsi Max, which is absolutely my favourite drink. After walking 20,000 steps a day, when we got back onto the ship, we would be desperate for a drink. We would sit in this main atrium, which was split over multiple levels. It has two staircases in the middle and these huge glass windows on the side. I have to say, I think P&O have some of the worst value drinks packages available and for almost everybody, it makes more sense to just pay as you go. The drinks prices on P&O cruises are really pretty good. The price of a Pepsi, a regular Pepsi on Iona was less than it is in my local pub at home and it was proper Pepsi. What I liked too was that they always asked if you wanted ice or not, so I always said no. Don't get me wrong, if I'm cruising in the Caribbean, 
sure, put some icing in my drink, but in Northern Europe in October, I do not need it. In the atrium, there is a Costa Coffee and a restaurant called Keel and Cow. The Keel and Cow does cost extra and P&O do have a couple of specialty restaurants like this. If you do want to stick to the included food though, if you're taking a seven night cruise on Iona, you can eat in a different included restaurant every night. There's so many places where the food is included and I really like that. The first and the biggest place to get food is the buffet. The buffet was open from way before I got up until around 1 a.m. in the morning. It would only close for a couple of hours between that time. I'm used to cruise ships having long buffet opening times, but P&O's are extra good. And the chocolate cake that you can get at 1 a.m., absolutely fabulous, so good. There's also tea and coffee available anytime the buffet is open, which is almost always, and every cabin has a kettle in true British style. I usually drink peppermint tea, so I took a couple of peppermint tea bags from the buffet and kept them in my room for my early morning peppermint tea, which was very good. As well as having a kettle in the cabin, you'll also be given a couple of little packets of biscuits every day. Your Britishism of the week is what we call biscuits. Biscuits are a big deal here in the UK. Every house will have a biscuit tin full of biscuits and we have a full aisle in our supermarket just dedicated to biscuits. Generally speaking, what you guys in the US would call a cookie, we would call a biscuit in the UK. We do also use the word cookie, but a cookie is different from a biscuit. A cookie is bigger than a biscuit, it's normally gooey, whereas a biscuit is small and crunchy. What you guys in the US call a biscuit is totally different from our biscuit, but that's a different Britishism for a different day. All that you need to know is that these are biscuits and this is a cookie. An extra addition that most cruise ships don't have, but Iona has, is an area called the Keys. The Keys is basically like a food court, kind of like a small buffet, but everything is made for you as you order it. We would go here in the morning for pancakes, we would come here for burgers in the evening. It did remind me a little bit of the food court, the galley that you'll find on Virgin Voyages cruises, that they so desperately don't want to call a buffet. The Keys is located in the middle of the ship by the atrium and they even have a ketchup station here. I put ketchup on almost everything that I eat, so I love this station. P&O have four main restaurants, two at the back and two at the sides. We only ever went into the side restaurants for afternoon tea, which was very nice. P&O do a free afternoon tea and also a paid afternoon tea. I don't even think that I need to tell you that I obviously went to the free one and I went more than once. Afternoon tea was a little bit strange because you didn't order or pick your food in the way that you normally would. You still got food, of course, but everybody was kind of just given everything. And if you didn't eat something, it would just go to waste. In reality, it's just all mushed up and then put into the sea for fish food. And maybe it just encourages you to have an extra scone of which you can put on the jam and then the cream. Jam and then cream. P&O are one of the best cruise lines I've ever found when it comes to vegan dining. We have quite a high percentage of vegans here in the UK, so it makes sense. But on every main menu, there would be at least one starter, main and dessert that was completely vegan. Very cool. P&O do have fairly strict dress codes compared to other cruise lines, but the dress codes only really apply to the main dining rooms. On formal night, which is called celebration night for P&O, most of the men did have tuxedos or suits or at least a tie and a shirt. You could probably get away with just a shirt, maybe. On the other nights, apart from the formal night, the dress code was casual, but you're not supposed to wear trainers or light jeans in the restaurant. In reality, I think as long as you don't look scruffy and you don't have huge logos all over your clothes, it will be totally fine. If you do want to dress up though on a P&O cruise, if you have a prom dress or a bridesmaid dress that you want to wear, you will not look out of place. Some people wore incredible dresses, amazing tuxedos, and you will fit right in. Interestingly, there weren't any cruise ship photographers on board like there normally is on most cruises. According to P&O, this is because of COVID reasons. I'm not really sure why all the other cruise lines have managed to still do photography with COVID, but I quite liked it because it meant all of those prime photo spots like the stairs and the atrium, they weren't taken up by cruise ship photographers like they often are. We also went to the Beach House and the Olive Grove restaurants, which were both included in our cruise fare and we booked those in advance. The Beach House serves Mexican food and we had an amazing meal here. It usually costs extra on other cruise ships within the P&O Cruises fleet, so I suspect that it will start to cost extra on Iona. It was free for our cruise though, and it doesn't normally cost very much. It's normally, you know, seven pounds, 50, 10 pounds maybe. It's quite cheap. I had a pizza in the Olive Grove, which wasn't quite Princess's Alfredo's pizza, but all in all, the food was pretty good. I was never hungry, not for a second. 
As the cruise went on, I started thinking about the experience that I was having and the price that I'd paid for this cruise, an incredibly cheap cruise, and I was enjoying it a lot. I knew that I had a lot of family members at home who would love a cruise on Iona, so I started doing cruise planning to book another cruise on Iona while I was still on Iona, which is something I have never considered before, never ever. When we did get to Le Havre, we were treated to a boat show of sorts, but kind of by accident. We planned really just to wander around Le Havre to get some fresh air and to stretch our legs. As we tried to leave the port, we noticed that the road was closed and that the bridge was open. We stood there with other passengers for 45 minutes, just watching these boats come across and into Le Havre. I did a bit of research on my phone as I was stood there trying to work out what was happening. And it turned out that there was a big boat show leaving Le Havre the next day. And it was just a coincidence that we were there watching all of these ships arrive. There were TV crews, all kinds of interesting things to see and that's what you sometimes bump into when you just go for a walk in a port. We did have sunshine in Le Havre though which was absolutely amazing. We spent the rest of the day wandering around the ship sitting by the pool having a drink and exploring the promenade deck. The promenade deck is absolutely huge on Iona and I love that. It's here on the promenade deck that you'll find a group of cabins with a strange design. They sit just above the promenade deck. So when you're sitting out on your balcony, you're basically sitting on the promenade deck with everybody. And it's a long distance between your balcony and the edge of the ship. It's a really strange design. You can see into the cabins quite well. So if I was cruising on Iona and in a balcony, I would be avoiding these cabins. I'm not really sure why they're like this or who designed it. I'm normally in an inside cabin anyway, but just something to bear in mind. It's a bit strange. All of the non-restaurant areas on the ship were also lovely and my brother described the look as being that of a nice hotel. I think I would agree with that. There was a lot of marble, a lot of clean lines and there were lots of things like cushions and fabrics around that made it feel more kind of expensive. Even the pub was well designed. It did have some sort of Weatherspoons vibe to it but none of that stickiness that you'd normally find in a Weatherspoons. We came to the pub I think almost every day and we did the daily trivia which was cool. It was nice for me to do trivia that was on a British cruise ship because often when I'm cruising on American cruise ships I have no idea what's going on on trivia but they even had a question about Coronation Street on this trivia. That's how British it was. I still didn't do very well but it was nice to at least have more of a chance. If you're from outside the UK, you can still book a P&O cruise. The easiest way at the moment seems to be through the US travel agency Vacations to Go. My friends Sean and Steph came over to the UK from the US a few years ago to take a couple of P&O cruises. It was so interesting for me to see my American friends discover P&O, to discover all of these little British things that I don't even notice. When I was on board Iona, I actually did book another cruise on Iona and I think that's the highest praise that I can give to a ship. Not just because I've rebooked this cruise for me, but because I'm planning on bringing eight family members on this cruise. So that is pressure. P&O, please do not let me down. The price for two adults and two children in a balcony for seven nights was £1,500, which is around $2,000. For me in my inside cabin, it works out to around £385 for the week. That's maybe $500 including gratuities. I honestly, how P&O are making any money at these prices, I have no idea, but that's not my problem. I'm going to go and have a good time. I only hope that my next cruise on Iona lives up to what I've said about it and that the increasing capacity does not change things too much. This cruise does sail from the UK, which makes things a lot easier. My last cruise was a fly cruise and it was absolutely amazing to get out of the UK, but it was definitely not without its problems. To find out how I nearly got stuck in Spain and what my first fly cruise since the pandemic was like, check out this video next.